Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight for Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. In just over a month, the first phase of Oregon's legalized marijuana program kicks in. Possession of up to eight ounces of pot and four plants at home becomes legal as of July 1st under voter pass measure 91. Then in January, the OLCC must start accepting license applications for retail sales. The commission has been compiling community input as it draws up regulations for recreational pot. How will the state meet those deadlines? And what is the state learning from citizen input? Here to give us some insight, welcome to my guest, the chairman of the OLCC, Rob Patridge. The chairman's job is an all-volunteer job. Mr. Patridge lives in Medford, where his day job is as Klamath County District Attorney. But Patridge has been charged with carrying out the state's new legal marijuana policy. And a Washington, D.C. think tank just named Patridge one of the 12 most influential people in the U.S. on marijuana policy. Welcome to Straight Talk. It's great to have you here. Thanks. Happy to be here this evening. What is the number one priority for you in crafting this new marijuana policy? You know, the number one priority for us is really to be inclusive. We've gone throughout the state of Oregon. Uh, we had 11 town halls around the state. We had over 4,000 people appear in front of us. We've We've had tens of thousands of hits on our website, marijuana.oregon.gov, and we're continuing that. We just announced 70 people from throughout the state that are going to help us create these rules as we look towards legalizing pot in Oregon. So when it's legal on July 1st, what is the most important thing you want Oregonians to know? You know, we want them to know what the rules are. We want clarity around the rules. We're in the middle of putting together a, a public uh, awareness campaign about what the new pot rules are because people don't know. Even those who voted for it and those in the industry don't know. So we're really in the, in the process of launching that so that there's clarity, so that police know what's, what they can have and, and the public knows what they can have. So on July 1st, it's legal, but you won't be able to buy it. Why not? Right. You, well, the, the way the measure was crafted, it basically gave seven months to, uh, to, for it to become legal on July 1st. It was passed in November of last year, and then July 1st it becomes legal for what we're calling the home grow provisions. And uh, those home grow provisions, um, you know, put it into people's hands immediately. So the legislature didn't have a hand in crafting that. Really, the voters of Oregon did. So you can grow it at home and and use it as of July 1st, but there's no retail stores to buy it legally. Absolutely, there's not. And, uh, you know, we're watching the legislature go on in Salem right now in front of the Joint Measure 91 Committee, and it's been five months and no bills have come out of that committee yet, and we've asked them for some really clarification around what the OLCC needs to do, um, as well as uh, the Oregon Health Authority under their medical marijuana program. Well, the legislature is really grappling with this, a really tough issue. But from what I've read, you, you think you're not going to be able to open retail stores until late next year. That's right, because there's a public process that's involved, and we've got rulemaking, and then people can oppose those rules. So we need to have transparency related to this, and we need to have fidelity in our system. But and why so long? People are going to say, well, that's a long time to wait. Well, you know, we're waiting for the legislature to be done with their thing before we can even pass our rules. So we're waiting for the statutory changes. We, we had over 52 statutory recommendations, most of which the marijuana industry is in favor of. It's just simple things like uh, what the proper name for marijuana. It was wrong in Measure 91 that went before the voters because it's been changed since then. What did it say? Well, the description, the, the scientific description of marijuana has changed. And so, I mean, that's just a, a simple example of the things that need to happen and occur. Uh, OLCC can't possess marijuana in accordance with the measure. So if somebody had marijuana illegally, we couldn't, we couldn't take it so we could prove a case against them. So those are some of just the simple things that need to get done before we can go in and continue to regulate those things. Well, one of the things lawmakers are talking about is allowing recreational pot to be sold alongside medical marijuana at the medical marijuana dispensaries temporarily. What about that? What do you think about that idea? Well, you know, as I, I advised the legislature last night, I was asked that question, and and what they and I think that uh, it's a it's a really big issue for them. Um, they they'd like to move quicker to bring marijuana to market, but uh, the fed the federal government has put down a set of guidelines called the Cole Memorandum, which prescribe that basically the marijuana has to be tracked through the system. I've warned the legislature that they could put the entire medical marijuana system at risk if they allow. Uh, pot to be sold at one of these medical marijuana dispensaries because there's no tracking. We don't know where it came from. We don't ne know necessarily how it got there, but, it, but it, it arrives in these medical dispensaries. I'm also concerned that people won't be able to get their medicine. And 
you know, there's a variety of and a host of other problems. How are we going to collect the tax? And it's just not reasonable for the Department of Revenue or the OLCC in October to try and put something together to collect a tax. They've worked for five months and still haven't been able to do the statutory fixes. So how could we be expected to do the tax collection and put everything else in place um, if people wanted to dispute the tax? or anything else. It's, it, it, there's a whole set of rules that people need to have in order to have equity. Yeah, you have proposed that recreational pot and medical marijuana be sold at the same medical marijuana dispensaries if mm. the medical marijuana people accept really strict guidelines. How would that work and when could that start? Absolutely. We introduced uh, to the legislature this week the opt-in provision that would allow them to opt into the OLCC system to sell medical marijuana at an OLCC licensed store. We have got buy-in from the medical marijuana community and the growers community. Uh, it's been a carefully crafted measure that we hope to take as an entire package over the next two weeks to the legislature and put a bow on it and hopefully uh, that will encourage people to come uh, into from the black market system uh, into the light as we would like to but say. A lot of medical marijuana people don't want things to change. They like the medical marijuana program the way it is. Right. Well uh, this last week the medical marijuana uh, system was changed at least by the Senate and the House has to consider it. There was a 29 to 1 vote. That was a Senate bill that would make stricter guidelines for medical marijuana, but it goes to the House where there's more skepticism in the House. Absolutely. And we're just waiting to see how that all plays out. And the OLCC really has to sit on the sit on the sidelines to look at that because that's all going to impact our budget. They're talking about having the OLCC be the contracted agency to do some of those inspections to track some of that marijuana. So it's really up in the air and the OLCC is is waiting patiently and working collaboratively with the legislature and uh, and the uh, marijuana industry as well as local government and we have a strong there's strong interest in local government about opt-out provisions and those types of things. Do you think the House will be able to pass it? The medical marijuana industry is very strong. They have a strong lobby. Well, you know, your guess is as good as mine as a former member of the House uh, who served six years in the Oregon legislature. Um, things change and the dynamics change. So um, I think there is a strong interest, though, in the House um, about having some kind of local opt-out on the medical marijuana side. Let's take a look at the price of marijuana throughout the country and in here in Oregon. This Absolutely. Is, we got this data from a website called priceofweed.com where people anonymously submit the cost of weed in their area and it was reported in the Washington Post. So you see a map here. Nationally, the average price of an ounce of high-quality marijuana is $324. In states where it's legal, Washington, Colorado, Alaska, it's below $300, actually $232 in Washington, $243 in Colorado. And it's cheapest in the entire country here in Oregon, and it's not even legal here. It's only $204. Why is it so cheap here in Oregon when it's not legal yet? Well, as a lifetime resident almost of uh, Jackson County, and as uh, somebody who is, was the chief drug prosecutor in Jackson County for two years um, as a deputy district attorney, it's abundant. We have great water, we have great sunshine, and they can grow a lot of weed. And it's, uh, and it's really about the uh, it's really about the economics of it. And the we, Oregonians we're, said we're the Saudi Arabia of marijuana. Well, some people have compared us to Napa Valley, but uh, you know, we, we have the environment and we have the, the water and the land. And uh, it's pretty amazing if you take a helicopter ride over the, uh, over the Illinois Valley in Southern Oregon and, and to see the amount of marijuana that's uh, being grown there. Well, the Oregonian reported that Oregon's legally allowed pot producers harvest enough pot, not just for medical marijuana patients in Oregon, but there's enough for patients in Washington, Colorado, and Arizona. So a lot of marijuana. Can these two programs, the medical marijuana program and the recreational pot program, exist, coexist together and still diminish the black market, have that goal of diminishing the black market? I, I think that they can, and I think that that's part of the big reason that we provided this opt-in provision is I think that there's a lot of medical marijuana growers who really want to move over and do the right thing. A lot of, you know, I would estimate about 75% of the, of the um, medical marijuana is going out into the black market today. Um, we're, we, we overproduce for what we, what we have, and we can see that through the DEA statistics all over the country. Uh, and we can look, uh, we can look uh, to Europe and see in Europe, uh, you know, where in Amsterdam that Oregon marijuana is some of the highest quality and, and highest sought in after in the, in the world. So, you know, those are, those are some of the things that, that we look at. But I think that people want to come in, they want to run a legitimate business, and they see a future uh, across the country as marijuana is making their move in. It's on the ballot in California. It's on the ballot in a lot of other states. We're getting calls at OLCC uh, from these other states. I'm getting calls from state regulators from around the country uh, who are looking at potentially facing uh, the legalization of marijuana. Another controversial program 
program would be the edibles. That is hugely popular in Colorado. I read it makes up 45% of the market, but there have also been problems with edibles. How soon do you think we'll see edibles available for purchase in Oregon? You know, I think we're trying to move along with the edibles at, at the same rate as we are everything else. Um, edibles are going to be slower because there's many different types of them and there's going to be different regulations around the types. Um, I think we've learned a lot from Washington and Colorado. We, we certainly don't want to make the mistakes of our neighbors. And so consequently, um, we're trying to work collaboratively. Once the legislature has some of the testing requirements, it's not clear of whether the Oregon Health Authority, the OLCC, are going to do the testing um, on let's those and licensing. talk about the testing, too, because um, some of the research done in Colorado showed the marijuana was dirty, that had fungus, bacteria. How are you going to prevent that? Here? Yeah, and that's been shown here in Oregon amongst the medical products. So we want... We want, uh, in Oregon, we've, we've clearly came out and said that we want uh, certified laboratories, and we want a whole set of standards, and we want the OLCC to license these laboratories so that they're all done. We don't need people with test strips sitting in their basement saying, oh, that looks like it's okay. That's not okay, and it's a, it's a consumer product. Just like anything you'd buy off a grocery store shelf, we need to treat it as and such. And back to the edibles, uh, Colorado has seen uh, some of the children end up in the ER, some tourists who come in right. and don't really know what the potency is of the edibles because I understand the potency is not your, your parents or your grandparents' yeah, potency. It's yeah. like two or three times the THC content of right. 20 to 30 years ago. So tourists are coming in, eating too much of the edible and ending up in the ER. I mean, how are you going to have more labeling, potency listed? Yeah, absolutely. We're, we, we want potency, we want labeling, we want dosage requirements. It's not the ditch weed of the 1970s. It really is a very powerful product. And we have an obligation, I think, as a, it's a new product, and we have an obligation to educate the consumer. Part of the big problem is people getting sick and ending up in the AR is they eat, they eat something that's marijuana laced, and it, they don't have an immediate effect, so they eat more of it. And they're getting overdosed as a result of the fact that they've got to wait for the effect to take place. It's not an immediate kind of effect. How much money is the state going to make from legalizing pot? You know, it, it's a dartboard out there, and uh, you know we're we're pretty re resonant to say what what we're going to make one way or the other. We look at Colorado and Washington's predictions, and they're wildly off from what their predictions are. So they're setting all kinds of record in Vancouver it, it, selling pot. Yeah, but their but their revenue projections for their state are way off in both Washington and Colorado. Um, in Oregon, uh, what we advocated for and I'm advocating for is to change the tax to the retail end instead of at the grower end, as was in the ballot measure. We've had the industry come out and say we want to change the tax to the retail end. So now we're even changing and shifting our dynamic um, based on but that. But you'll make enough money to pay for all of these regulations and everything. Well, we hope we make enough money to, that the agency will pay for itself and, uh, and make that happen and at the same time uh, put money back in the pockets of schools and local government uh, to make sure that they can enforce it at Let's the local level. Let's talk about all the money because right now the growers will be taxed and there's going to be a boatload of money. And when you talk about the feds and banking, mm -hmm. the banks don't want to touch marijuana money because it's illegal federally. You're going to have, from what I understand, up to $500,000 a month brought to the OLCC in wheelbarrows and cash. Doesn't that create a lot of problems? It does create a lot of problems, and we just put a half a million dollars into our budget so we can uh, harden the OLCC headquarters so we can have the capacity to accept the cash that's there. And we're continuing to work with the governor's office and the state treasurer's office uh, surrounding the banking issue. We've got to figure out a solution on the banking issue. It doesn't make any sense. This is going to be with the seed to sale tracking system. You know, the feds will be able to watch how the marijuana moves through the system and that it's not you know, this cartel money and other things. So well, I know uh, Congressman Blumenauer has been working on, on the banking component of that. Absolutely. He attended one of our town halls and spoke very eloquently on, on the issue related to the banking. Talking about the federal government again, you know, they're taking that hands-off approach right now, but it doesn't mean it will always be that way. They've retained the authority to step in if they see violations, for example, if pot is crossing state lines. We see Nebraska and Oklahoma suing Colorado because they say pot is moving into their state, causing problems. Do you worry that Oregon could see a lawsuit? Let's just take, for example, from Idaho. I, I certainly see the fact that Oregon could potentially have a lawsuit related to to this. You know, it's going to be a matter of you know what's what's happening out in Ontario and what you know is stuff just moving over into Boise. It's a huge issue. Uh, we already know that Oregon's an exporter state, though, for black market uh, marijuana. So, you know, I, it, it's going to be interesting legally. It's going to be an interesting political issue um, as as we continue over the next decade or so. 
If the Obama administration is taking this hands-off approach, why hasn't it removed marijuana from the Control One list on the Controlled Substance Act, where it's listed with heroin and having no medicinal value? Well, it certainly makes it it certainly makes it more complicated for us to regulate as the OLCC. It certainly makes it uh, difficult to research, and I know that there's a lot of people who have a very very strong interest in changing the schedule of the controlled substance. Uh, but uh, I don't see a lot of movement out of Washington related to this, and we certainly are starting into a presidential election cycle. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out with as many states that have medical marijuana in place. Um, almost the majority of states in the country have medical marijuana, some type of medical marijuana law. So it'll be interesting to see. Another big concern that people have, we did a KGW investigation on hash oil uh -huh. and some of the problems caused by hash oil explosions. Firefighters in Forest Grove were called out last year on a hash oil explosion at a home near Pacific University. And they said they didn't even really know what hash oil was at the time. The fire was intense, it engulfed the house. The man that had been cooking the hash oil had serious burns. And Colorado is having an explosion or spike in hash oil explosions. Are you concerned about that in Oregon? We certainly are. We, we, we certainly are, and I think that that's why we're trying to work with our law enforcement and public safety partners and the fire departments and everything to try and really get out, go out and educate. And uh, that's going to be part of OLCC's mission is to you know, try and bring as many people into our system that are well educated so we can do this in a safe and responsible manner. Lots more to talk about Rob Patridge. We'll have more with OLCC Chairman Rob Patridge when we come back. Plus, our commentators get in on this. They answer this question, should Oregon communities have the right to ban marijuana sales? We're back in two minutes. Welcome back to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. Oregon's about to enter a new era when it comes to marijuana. Recreational pot will be legal on July 1st. What's that going to look like for Oregon? Welcome once again to my guest, the chairman of the Oregon Liquor Control Commission, Rob Patridge, the man in charge of bringing the legal marijuana market to life. In your county, in Klamath County, 56% of the voters voted against legalizing pot, as did 22 counties out of the 36 in Oregon. You've been the DA. Did, did you vote against legalizing pot? I did vote against legalizing pot, and I, you know, I'm not sure this was the right method by which to do it, but uh, I've committed that Oregonians have uh, had their say, and now we're going to put the best regulated system we can in uh, to help control the black market and to help continue to keep it done in a safe and responsible manner. How do you respond to critics who wonder and question why you were put in charge of this whole thing when you're personally opposed to marijuana? You know, I was on the OLCC ahead of this measure even passing and was asked to be the chair ahead of this measure passing. And, you know, I, I think part of the reason I was asked to be the chair by a Democratic governor as a Republican was that I'm a consensus builder. And I think that um, our, this week our work with the uh, marijuana growers shows uh, what kind of consensus we can work together to build. And I think that they've developed a trust and faith that we are going to do the right thing uh, because they did pass a measure in Oregon. But they want to make sure it's done right, and we, we've convinced them of that as well, um, to make sure that it's a long-term industry. They don't just want a flash in the pan. You've been in Oregon a long time. Talk a little bit about the cultural change we've seen around marijuana in this state. You know, it's been it's been phenomenal to, to sit and watch the cultural change. We were one of the leaders early on in medical marijuana. Uh, we've been a leader on, you know, a variety of things in Oregon, but medical marijuana was one of those. And um, it doesn't surprise me that this has uh, come to result where it is today. And it's funny, I've read a lot recently about uh, prohibition and how alcohol became um, illegal and then legal again and it follows a lot of the same path that we're following on marijuana. Um, yes. It was medicinal alcohol and then it became legal again and so there's a variety of parallels so it's been an interesting history lesson for me as well. Is everything, if everything goes as planned, what is your vision for what Oregon will look like with legalized pot? I think ultimately what it looks like is uh, is a thriving cannabis business throughout the entire state of Oregon. I think what it looks like frankly is uh, well-regulated, well-lit stores that are that are closely monitored, um, that are hopefully similar to what we have in liquor um, today, that somebody can go into the store and get medical marijuana for their medical ailment, or they can get recreational marijuana in Oregon. And I think that that's the vision that everybody has. I don't think that, uh, I think the industry is on board to try and make this a top shelf kind of example for the rest of the country. As we talked before, there's uh, an excess of marijuana, and I know that many of those people are trying to be poised uh, for the future. I'm not saying I encourage that, but by the same token, I think that that's where people see it going. Is legal pot good for Oregon? 
Um, I don't think so personally, but uh, I think we need to do it in a safe and responsible manner if we're going to do it. Is that hard for you to do when you don't think it's really good for your state personally, but you're in charge of making this work? You know what? It's not. I mean, I you know I, I have to do it every day in court. I have to make really tough decisions uh, related to people's lives that will affect them for the rest of their life. And I think that I can separate the two and I can put aside what my own personal feelings are to try and do what I believe is the best thing for Oregon and provide that voice and balance that needs to be part of the equation. And I've tried to show myself as being open to do that. We have just about 15 seconds and I want to let people know about a website, but there'll be an education campaign people will be seeing soon, right? Yeah. Track everything in marijuana at marijuana.oregon.gov, our website, yeah. We have a website where people can look at frequently asked questions, they can leave you comments, that sort of thing. Will they be seeing commercials on about marijuana soon? They'll be seeing our public education campaign at that site. They'll be seeing everything related to what's what we're doing in the rules process and how we're going to put these businesses up and how they're going to be regulated. Is there going to be a jingle like with Cover Oregon? Uh, you know, we don't have any banjos planned. All right. Thank you, Rob Patters. We hope you'll come back and visit with us as we go through this process. Thanks for having me, Laurel, and thanks for doing the segment. Thank you. Now to this week's commentary, and we stick to the topic of legal pot in Oregon. A majority of voters in 22 of the state's 36 counties voted against Measure 91, and the Oregon legislature has been debating a bill that would allow cities and counties to ban retail outlets without a vote of the people, as stipulated in the measure. So we asked our commentators this question. Should Oregon communities have the right to ban marijuana sales? Straight talk from the left and from the right. Should communities have the right to ban pot sales in Oregon? The short answer is yes, they should. I think individual communities should be able to make their own choices about whether marijuana is sold locally. Obviously, under state law, you'll be able to grow your own pot, so the 420 crowd is not going to be deprived of their sacred weed. And you can always buy your bud in some other town and bring it home, the way folks used to have to do when Monmouth, Oregon was a dry community. And speaking of Monmouth, that town went wet about a dozen years ago. It was the last dry community on the west coast of America. And Oregon's current state law, new dry communities are prohibited. So my position on pot is inconsistent with the state's laws on alcohol, but I think they're different. We have a lot of experience with booze and very little with pot. Frankly, I hope the state takes a wait and see attitude as Colorado and Washington run their experiments with legalization. Find out the unintended consequences and then decide whether towns want it sold locally. Nobody has yet to come up with a way to do a breathalyzer for pot that tells you when you last smoked, and that's going to be a problem for police. And blood and urine tests are likely to see court challenges by the cannabis challenge crowd until the laws catch up with the popularity of pot. Now, straight talk from the left. Once upon a time, Oregon let cities ban sales of alcohol. In 2002, Monmouth stopped being Oregon's last dry city, and the state later ended the local option. So if the state plans to treat marijuana like alcohol, as Oregon's voters seem to wish, the precedent is clear. As an Oregonian, you have the right to buy marijuana in whatever city you live. This isn't just a matter of cannabis consumer rights. It's a matter of our all being Oregonians together. The state has great expectations for the new marijuana tax revenue. It plans to spend its new money on things to benefit the entire state, maybe even some more state police. Cities should not be able to excuse themselves from the process. We don't yet know how the Oregon marijuana market is going to work. We have not yet heard from the legislature's marijuana joint committee. And yes, that is technically what you'd call a legislative committee with members from both the Senate and the House. It's not as if we're going to have a state Cincinnati superstore in every city. But whatever the final arrangements are, we can't have cities opting out of state policy. And remember, Monmouth has survived, even if the city now lets you buy a six-pack. We would love to hear what you think. We always welcome your comments. You can send them to us on Twitter. Just follow us at KGW Straight Talk. And we want to remind you that the OLCC does have a website where you can ask questions or leave your comments. And that website is marijuana.oregon.gov. Thank you once again to my guest, the OLCC Chairman Rob Patridge. And thank you for watching. We'll see you next week for Straight Talk. Thank you again. Thanks, really. yeah. It's a pleasure.